the title of the talk is actually slightly inaccurate because um, work on algorithms is done, in fact, by all the groups at ICSI. But uh, ours is the group that uh, makes it the central focus. And so I want to just give a historical survey of the uh, activities of the group over the 20 years since ICSI was founded in 1988. And uh, the algorithms group, which I think initially was called the theory group, um, was one of the four uh, pillars that were determined as the foundation for ICSI. So uh, I want to talk uh, about some of the general goals that have guided us over time. Um, first of all, we're interested in some of the uh, fundamental issues of uh, that side of theoretical computer science that's concerned with complexity and algorithms. So that includes things like um, complexity classes, uh, cryptography. Mike Luby, in particular, who uh, is sitting in the audience uh, today, whoops, um, uh, uh, did fundamental work in cryptography at ICSI. Questions like the power of randomization. Oh, for the future audience, they said whoops, because I realized that uh, <laughs> today is not the day that you'll be seeing this talk. Um, another uh, particular uh, topic that was interesting to us in the late 80s especially was uh, decision making under uncertainty. Uh, algorithms where you have to make choices uh, in response to a stream of queries or inputs, uh, but you don't know the future. Those are called online algorithms and a related topic being conducted by our uh, satellite group in Oregon under John Moody is reinforcement learning. Uh, another theme that has emerged over the years and which I'm particularly interested in at present is to create bridges between the theory of computation and the natural sciences, and I'll say something about that later on. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we always have the goal of supporting the other projects at ICSI, and in particular, uh, we've had a history of very uh, intimate collaboration with the uh, networking group. Uh, more specifically, we've been very interested in uh, networking problems, uh, even before the networking group was uh, established in, in its uh, current incarnation. So I'll talk about some work that was done in the uh, late 1990s headed by Mike Luby uh, having to do with improving the reliability and speed of bulk data transfer over the internet. And so I'll give a very cursory introduction to tornado codes and LT codes. I'll also talk about some work that we did on distributed hash tables for peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, in the uh, uh, year, uh, around the year 2001. Uh, in general, the uh, format of the talk will be to touch on about um, five topics giving you just a, a little bit of a description of each, but without going very deeply into any one of them. Um, another theme that has been important to us over the years is uh, biology. And um, uh, initially, in the, even as far back as the early 90s, I worked with uh, a team of students on uh, genome sequencing. But over the last several years, uh, after the successful sequencing of the human genome, we've been interested more in what's called functional genomics or sometimes systems biology in which you try to understand how genes and proteins work together to regulate cellular processes. And more recently, uh, with the advent of uh, Iran Halperin as a uh, member of the algorithms group, our emphasis has uh, moved towards uh, studying the causal links or the associations between variation in the genomes of individuals and disease. And I'll give one or two quick examples of the kinds of projects that we've done there. Uh, the group has gone through uh, historical stages, just as ICSI has. Uh, the group was founded at the beginning of ICSI in uh, 1988. and. Uh, um, I was the first member, but I was very quickly joined by Mike Luby and uh, Lenore Blum. Uh, Lenore uh, works on um, 
computational complexity over the reals, the kind of way, of, the way that uh, people in scientific computing often think about computation, where you think of a real number as a basic monolithic object. Um, during the 90s, we had a very active visitor program. Uh, we had funding in those days uh, to uh, bring, first of all, uh, postdocs from Germany, as we have always done and continue to do. Currently, we have five German postdocs in the group. Um, but also, we had the ability to bring senior scientists from Germany and from other countries. So we really had, during those years, a, a flow of some of the leading people in the theory of computation, uh, mostly from uh, abroad, who came through and influenced our work. Uh, one of the highlights came around 1997, where uh, Mike Luby, with a team of uh, collaborators, developed some very interesting erasure codes that are suitable for bulk transfer of data over the inter for content delivery over the internet. Um, in 1999, the uh, AT&T Center for Internet Research was created uh, here at ICSI, uh, headed by Scott Schenker, and. Um, in its time, it was the leading networking group in the world, the re leading research group on internet-related networking problems in the world with um, people like uh, Sally Floyd and Vern Paxson and Scott Schenker and Mark Handley and Paul Francis um, all involved. And so during that time, um, I and the other members of the group had a particularly close relationship with that activity, and one of the outcomes of that came in 2001 with our work on the design of distributed hash tables, which I'll describe. Uh, starting in 2003, more or less, um, we uh, had an increasing emphasis on f functional genomics, understanding how cells are regulated. And uh, from that time onward, uh, we've had a, a very close interaction with uh, people at Tel Aviv University in Israel. And uh, Ron Shamir has been a frequent visitor. He's here somewhere. And uh, Iran will be continuing at ICSI while also being a professor at Tel Aviv. Um, and uh, under Iran's influence, as I mentioned, uh, statistical genetics research has become a major theme in the group. So, in the remainder of the talk, uh, I'm just going to give uh, brief glimpses into about uh, uh, five areas uh, that represent some of the most memorable work that, that we've done. Uh, and the first topic is uh, billed as, how much is it worth to know the future? So in many situations, uh, including life itself, we have to make decisions in response to a sequence of events or challenges or queries uh, without knowledge of the future. Examples are scheduling jobs as they arrive at a factory, processing queries to a database, uh, various uh, optimization problems where the data for the problem evolves over time, investment, and even the conduct of life itself, if you want to stretch things a little bit. Um, and. Um, the question is how to evaluate an online algorithm. And one of the formulations that has, uh, was intensively studied, especially in the 80s, but continues on, um, is what's called the, worst, the competitive ratio, which is the worst case ratio between the cost incurred by an online policy um, and the cost of an optimal, well, I call it a psychic policy, a policy that really knows how the, somehow knows how the future is going to unfold. So the question is then, how much do you lose in investment or in processing jobs or something like that when you don't really know the whole future history of the demand? So instead of talking about life or investment or anything interesting like that, I'll talk about a very narrow problem, uh, but an important one called paging, which you all know about. So in a computer system, uh, you have a slow memory and you have a cache, which I'll refer to here as the fast memory. Slow memory has a very large capacity and uh, contains uh, some number n of pages. And the fast memory has space for a limited number, say k. 
Uh, and so what you'd like is to keep in the cache those pages that are about to be requested. Unfortunately, you don't know what those are. So um, a sequence of page requests arrives. Uh, uh, at first, you just bring the first few pages in until the cache becomes full. But then, as further requests come along, it may happen that a page is requested which is not in the fast memory. And at that point, you have to evict some page to make room for it. And the goal is to minimize the number of page faults. If you knew the future, it would be easy. You would just look ahead, and when you have to replace a page, you would replace the one whose next request is furthest in the future. And it's not hard to show that this is an optimal policy. So this is what we're competing against when we try to define the competitive ratio. Now, if you look at deterministic paging algorithms, uh, you face the situation where um, you can think of yourself, you have to think of yourself as playing against an adversary who knows the text of your algorithm and therefore can predict your deterministic actions and will then try to pick, uh, in this case, a sequence of page requests which is going to make your online algorithm look as foolish as possible. Uh, and in this case, it's uh, pretty natural to suppose that what the adversary will do at any step will be to, do, to request the very page that you just kicked out of the cache. Um, and uh, you can show that uh, any algorithm uh, has to have a competitive ratio of at least k, the size of the cache, in that situation. And also, there's a family of algorithms that achieve that optimal competitive ratio for deterministic algorithms. Uh, they're called marking algorithms. And a marking algorithm marks each requested page. And when all the pages in the fast memory are marked, it unmarks them all. And it never evicts a marked page. So when it has to evict a page, um, it, uh, it evicts a page that was already sitting in the cache before the current round of marking began. And uh, several particular algorithms that are used in practice uh, happen to be marking algorithms, and any marking algorithm achieves a competitive ratio of k. Now, in a situation like this, it's obviously a terrible handicap to be a deterministic algorithm which then gives an adversary complete knowledge of what you're going to do and complete ability to make you look as foolish as possible. So it's natural to suppose that there might be a benefit in a randomized algorithm where the online algorithm makes random choices. The adversary will still know the text of your algorithm, but he won't know the actual realization of your random choices, and that will make it harder to uh, create worst case examples. So the question is how much benefit, uh, not only in this problem, but in many online problems, the question is how much benefit is there in uh, randomization? So uh, that was studied by uh, an Israeli uh, colleague, Amos Fiat, Mike Luby, and myself, and actually also by another group that joined forces with us in the ultimate publication. Um, uh, we studied uh, a randomized marking algorithm. Uh, so what is, first of all, what, is, what do you mean by the competitive ratio in the case where the algorithm is randomized? So we define it to be the worst case ratio of the expected cost of the online algorithm uh, compared to the uh, cost of a psychic algorithm uh, which knows its own sequence, which knows the sequence it's going to generate but uh, does not adapt to your actions. It has to pick the sequence in advance, knowing only the text of your algorithm, but not your random choices. And it turns out that the uh, competitive ratio that's achievable in this case is smaller, and it's expressed in terms of the kth harmonic number, 1 plus a half plus a third up to 1 over k, which is about the natural logarithm of k. Um, and a randomized marking algorithm achieves a competitive ratio we showed of two times the harmonic number minus one, where the algorithm uh, simply uh, is a marking algorithm, but when it has to evict a page, it evicts a random unmarked page. Uh, and we also had a proof that the best possible competitive ratio is uh, a lower bound on the competitive ratio is the same harmonic number, so we were within a factor of two of, of optimum. 
uh, later people came up with a very complicated algorithm that actually achieves the competitive ratio h of k. So in the, in the late 80s, we, we studied many problems about these uh, online algorithms. The subject is, still has many open questions. Uh, one of the key people who came to work with us during that time was Alan Borodin uh, from the University of uh, Toronto, who later co-authored the definitive book on online algorithms. So next, I'm going to talk about the work that uh, Mike Luby pioneered in the late 90s. Uh, so the setting for this is, um, think of a, 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 a source sending out packets to many places on the internet. Uh, so the, a message is a set of packets to be transmitted to one or many receivers. And we'll assume that uh, the main problem we face uh, is not errors, but erasures, the failure of a packet to be delivered. We'll call that an erasure. Uh, from the point of view of the receiver, the, the receiver never gets to see that packet. So the goal of an erasure code is to use a minimal amount of redundancy so that you send not only the message, but some additional packets associated with the message to recover the message despite erasures. And this depends on a model, uh, on, a on a model of how many erasures that you, you expect. And um, the techniques that uh, Luby and colleagues pioneered obtained very fast encoding and particularly decoding algorithms and uh, lower redundancy than previous codes by a very interesting mathematical construction. So this work was concerned with what are called low density parity check codes. So this is a situation where uh, the receiver knows which messages to expect, it messages one through n. It knows how many messages to expect, and the messages are labeled. Um, and so the receiver can figure out which messages it got erased, the ones that didn't come through. And the way the code is designed is that in, in addition to sending the actual content in, in packetized in messages, um, it also, uh, tra the, the sender also transmits check packets, which are exclusive ORs, XORs of subsets of the messages. So for example, the, uh, and, and, the for and the formula for which, one, which XORs are calculated by the ch uh, check digits, uh, are transmitted as check digits, um, will be the, uh, dependent on the design of the code. But one of the advantages of this particular scheme is that there is a uh, almost trivial way of trying to uh, figure out what the erasures, uh, what the erasure packets are. So, for example, um, suppose you have uh, a check digit, which is defined as the exclusive OR of the bit strings X, Y, and Z. And suppose it happens that you receive X and Y, um, but you don't receive Z. Well, knowing that z has not come through, you can still compute z because uh, z is the xor of c, x, and y. Um, now, another check digit is missing two, symbol, uh, two packets that got erased, v and t. So check digit d is the xor of v, z, and t. And uh, oops, I made a mistake. Um, the z should be in red and not the v, my mistake. So if you make that correction, you see that the second check digit knows V, and now it knows Z as well, because Z was determined from check digit C. And so again, it has only one unknown, and it can solve for T. And so what happens is that the information propagates. If you design the code correctly, uh, you start out by, um, by directly, uh, 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 so, uh, directly determining some erasure packets from equations like the first one. But then you get a kind of propagation where as more things become known, you can solve for more and more variables. And you're always solving in this particularly simple way. So you're never using something like Gaussian elimination to solve the system of equations. So the decoding is very fast and simple. But the question is uh, how, to, uh, how to design the code. And um, this was attacked by an all-star team of four now famous scientists, Luby, Mitzenmacher, Spielman, and Chakralahi, all of whom have gone on to greatness. 
Uh, and um, so you view the code as a, as a bipartite graph where you have the message nodes on one side and the check nodes on the other. And what you have to design is the adjacencies between the message nodes and the check nodes. And um, what you do is you pick a uh, distribution of degrees for the message nodes and, uh, and uh, degrees for the check nodes. Um, and, uh, and then you construct a random bipartite graph with those degrees. Um, and you then confront the mathematical model, or a problem of designing the, the, that degree distribution for the message nodes that will maximize the probability of reconstructing all of the lost packets, where you know the expected number of lost packets, but you have no control over which ones are going to be lost. And, um, uh, they solved this problem and got uh, extremely useful codes, uh, better than the previous codes of this general type. And of course, you benefit from the fast decoding algorithm. Now, toward the end of uh, Mike Luby's stay at ICSI, having done this work, uh, he, uh, he had another bright idea, another light bulb flashed in his mind. And the idea there was, you don't really need to specify exactly what the message nodes are in a public way. What you can do, and this is uh, amazing, is that if you, if you have some uh, large file, which you can think of as a set of packets, instead of specifying you know, exactly what the code is going to be, you just compute and transmit XORs of random subsets of those packets together with an identification tag saying which subset you XORed together. Um, and, and, and so there's no specific set of messages that's being sent, it, or you can think of it as infinite, or almost infinite, very large, uh, all, the, all the different subsets of the packets. Um, and the key to the design in this case is similar to the tornado code design, that you have to pick the right degree distribution, where the degree in this case means how many packets you're going to XOR together. And you have to pick the, a degree distribution which will allow this propagation to get started with some immediate inferences and then keep going all the way to the end. And uh, they figured out how to do that. They actually uh, had a, a later class of codes called Raptor codes that have some other features beyond that. And so this kind of scheme can be compared to a fountain where you're trying to fill a bucket with water and you don't really care which drops of the water you get as long as you fill your bucket. So you can fill it a little bit in the morning and come back for more in the afternoon. You have complete freedom over which, water, which droplets you're going to get. Here, you have complete freedom over which packets you receive. You can stop listening. You don't care if packets get dropped. As, as soon as you've collected enough packets, you know with high probability you're going to be able to decode. So that's an extremely powerful way of, uh, trans of bulk transmission of data. And it's the foundation for this company that Mike founded uh, called the Digital Fountain Company. OK, moving on. Uh, the next thing I want to tell you about is uh, uh, content addressable networks. So. Um, Around the year 2000, there, there were these uh, various um, music distribution uh, networks that were breaking the law left and right and uh, were storing vast amounts of, of data uh, in a distributed fashion over many computers. And, um, and they had ways of finding the song that they wanted to transmit and so on, but they were very clunky and inefficient. And so uh, working with the networking group, uh, we uh, uh, tried to study this problem scientifically, and we cast it as uh, constructing a distributed internet scale hash table. So the idea is that there's some vast amount of content, which in the case of a peer-to-peer -peer network is owned by various participants, many, many different participants. But they're, they've agreed that they're going to divide up and cooperate on storing all the data. So somebody else may be storing some of your stuff. You may be storing lots of other people's stuff in your computer. Um, and um, from the user's point of view, you want this to look like a hash table. He'll compute a hash function 
uh, and that will identify what, he's, what you're looking for. And then it'll be up to this distributed system to figure out which processor or processors, in the case of redundancy, carry the, have that information in them and return the information to you. So the problem then is to define a distributed internet scale hash table. And you want it to be scalable so you, the num processors can come and go. The number of processors can change radically. You want it to be fault tolerant, self-organizing, no centralized control, uh, and achieve low latency. And as I said, a major application would be to peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing systems. But it, it, it could also be relevant to large-scale storage management systems that are actually un owned by a single entity as well. Or it could be used on the internet for a distributed name server. And you can think of a number of other situations where you'd like to have this uh, um, very large distributed data store with these, uh, uh, with these properties. So we weren't the only group working on this. There were uh, three or four designs that came out around the same time, um, which differed in detail. They had many of the same elements. Um, and uh, the one we designed, and we in this case, is um, uh, Scott Shanker, Mark Hanley, um, a student named Silvio Ratnasamy, uh, Paul Francis, who was in the networking group, and myself. We were the ones who developed this. And um, one of your basic choices is, what is the address space? What is the structure of the set of all of these hash names? And we took it to be a, uh, a d-dimensional box. I'll give you a picture in, I think, the next slide or, or, or two. Uh, so uh, a d-dimensional box, but with the opposite boundaries identified. So if it were a two-dimensional box, it would be folded over into a torus. Uh, and this is uh, not a physical address space, but a virtual address space. In fact, it's the set of all of the hash addresses. And the space will be dynamically partitioned. So uh, in the simplest of the designs, uh, it'll be divided into zones, where each zone is the responsibility of one of the nodes in the network. And, uh, and uh, we decreed that these zones should uh, be rectilinear boxes. They should have their sides parallel to the coordinate axes. So, so you can think of this big box, which is the whole address space, is partitioned into these rectilinear boxes. Um, <clears throat> and the structure of this is that it's an overlay over the internet. So um, uh, the actual communication between processors is by internet messages, but the um, the processors are responsible for these zones, and therefore they have to know the IP addresses of their neighboring zones. Uh, and then when a request comes in, it'll be propagated from processor to processor, moving in the space, getting closer and closer to the zone that contains the hash address. The inter intermediate processors don't have to know the structure of the zones. They just have to know the general direction in which the information has to move. Uh, to get to the right place. Um, maybe I should skip ahead. Let's see. Uh, what do we got here? What? That doesn't look right. OK, something went wrong. There's a figure that should be there. Sorry. So let's do it in a Zen-like fashion. <laughs> Imagine that you have a, a, a big box. And it's been uh, subdivided by guillotine cuts. So first it got cut in half, and then each half got cut in half, and so on. So it's been divided into these zones by successive splittings. And you can also represent this as a tree structure, where the root of the tree is the whole space, and then it splits into two children, and those split, and so forth. Um, and if this slide actually existed, uh, you would see uh, how some of the algorithms work, and in particular, in particular the algorithm for uh, figuring out what to do when a processor uh, leaves the system, and so some other processor has to take over uh, its uh, zone. So what are some of the operations? Well, the, the most basic one is routing a message. And the idea is very simple. The message enters some, somewhere. Uh, and then, of course, it doesn't know 
in detail what this subdivision is into zones, but it knows the shortest distance in the, in the toroidal space to get, uh, to get to the target. And so it starts sending the message to neighbors in that direction. And they, in turn, forward it. And after a certain number of hops, which turns out to be about the dth root of the number of zones, where d is the uh, dimension of the space, uh, it'll get to the right place. Um, when, when a new node arrives, you want to split some zone and give it uh, half of that zone. And of course, there has to be some transfer of data at that point to accommodate the, to give some work to the new node. Uh, when a node departs, that's where the slide would have been useful. Uh, there's a technique for um, uh, identifying the, uh, the departing node in the splitting tree and then walking down to a, to a pair of sibling leaves in, below it in, somewhere in the splitting tree, and then making one of those leaves responsible for the zone of the departing node. Um, and, uh, the, and then there were various considerations that we uh, went into, such as uh, failure recovery, in which each node has to ping its neighbors and make sure that they ping back to know that the neighbors are still alive. And, uh, a number of other design considerations. One of the things that we, uh, we missed uh, in the design and that was later uh, discovered by John Kleinberg in, in a different context is that you can reduce uh, the number of hops enormously if you let each zone also have one long range link, not just to a neighboring zone. And it can be a random link uh, under a certain distance distribution. And uh, Kleinberg proved that instead of uh, uh, this n to the 1 over d behavior, you get something more like six degrees of separation if you have just that one additional random link. Um, but we missed that point. Um, and then there were a number of other refinements, uh, um, multiple nodes sharing the same zone. Uh, uh, multiple ways of partitioning the uh, multiple hash functions corresponding to multiple simultaneously existing partitions of the space into zones. Um, trying to assign processors to, to zones in such a way that uh, the, uh, the latency in going from a processor to a neighbor is short uh, and, and other things that we analyzed. So we, we had a, a sort of a a complete working blueprint. I don't know if anybody ever literally built a system using exactly what we did, although uh, the Ocean Store project at Berkeley was very similar. Um, but it, uh, it did influence the thinking uh, in this area. Uh, the last uh, topic that I want to go into uh, uh, is uh, in the area of our research where uh, Aran Halperin is the main, the main player and, and the leader. Uh, it has to do with uh, genomic variation. So uh, there are many differences between the genomes of any two individuals. Uh, and uh, a major uh, thrust in uh, genetics nowadays is to study how this genomic variation affects disease and, and other characteristics of individuals. Um, and um, this uh, area of association studies between gen genomic variation and disease has been identified by Science Magazine as the breakthrough of the year for 2007. Not because of what we're doing here, but because technology is available for, for, for efficiently doing many large-scale studies of this type, gathering large amounts of genomic data from individuals. And the hope is that we'll be able to understand the variations that are responsible for major diseases, like uh, different kinds of cancer. And there's a particular kind of variation that uh, is the most common, uh, variation at a single nucleotide site. So I think you all know that the genome is a sequence of nucleotides. And uh, the most common kind of variation is these polymorphic uh, sites, also known as SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, which are places in the genome uh, at a single nucleotide 
where two different uh, values of that nucleotide, let's say, an a, uh, can exist with some significant frequency, say a and, a and G, for example, out of the four symbol alphabet of the genome, A, C, T, and G. And, uh, we, and well over 10 million of these polymorphic sites uh, have been identified. So what happens in an association study is that you get uh, two populations of individuals called cases and controls. So the cases might be the people who have a particular disease. The controls might be uh, uh, individuals from the population who presumably don't have the disease. Um, and uh, it's now possible using uh, microarrays to, uh, to uh, measure uh, a large number of SNPs tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Uh, sequencing technology is, is advancing so rapidly that uh, uh, soon we'll be able to look at all of an individual's SNPs and even a whole genome for a few thousand dollars. Um, so uh, the problem then is having measured these variations is to find the variations that are indicative of disease and statistics gets heavily involved because you after all, if you're looking at tens of thousands of associations, then you know, just by chance it might happen that some SNP looks as if it's correlated with the disease when it really isn't. And so you have to have very subtle statistical tests to make sure that the results really are uh, meaningful. And it's complicated also by the fact that the cases and controls may be drawn from different populations. Uh, and even one person uh, whose ancestry is of mixed race uh, uh, may be a kind of mosaic of sections uh, descended from different ethnic groups. So it's, um, so it's a very complicated business to uh, uh, characterize the differences between the cases and the controls and the, the backgrounds of the individuals involved in order to uh, make appropriate statistical corrections, and this is one of the things that uh, Aran and his group have been have been doing. Now, uh, I want to talk about uh, one very specific uh, uh, technical problem that comes up in connection with this, uh, which arises from the fact that. The human genome, with the exception of the X and Y chromosomes, the human genome contains two copies of each chromosome, one received from each parent. And when you're measuring the contents of an individual's genome, uh, uh, as you do in these association studies, uh, it turns out that the experiment that does the measure, the, the most, the cheapest experiment, the one that's typically done, uh, gives you information that contains an important ambiguity. And that is that since you have two copies of the chromosome and you have therefore two copies of this polymorphic site where different nucleotides might occur, the experiments will give you back the pair of nucleotides occurring at that site, but it won't tell you which of them is on the paternal chromosome and which one is on the maternal chromosome. So you know the two, you know the two symbols at this site, you know the two symbols at some other site, but you don't know how they're assorted out, you know, whether the first one here goes with the first one there or the other way around. And it's complicated even more when you're looking at thousands of sites. So what you really want to know is the haplotypes. In other words, you, you want to know the sequence of symbols at these polymorphic sites on one copy of the chromosome because essentially that's what you're getting from one of your parents. It's the haplotypes that are being passed down, not the genotypes. The genotypes are the mixture of what's being passed down to you from two parents. So the problem is to uh, to figure out the haplotypes from the genotypes. And it seems impossible because at first sight, well, you know, any different way of assorting those nucleotides, parceling the, the pairs out to the two copies uh, is possible. So here, here's a picture that sort of uh, uh, clarify, might clarify what's going on. So uh, here we have uh, a small problem where you have uh, two polymorphic sites and 
Uh, this particular individual has uh, ATGGC on one, chromosome, one copy of the chromosome and in those same five locations, AGCGT on the other copy. Um, and uh, so the genotyping experiment uh, tells you that the individual is uh, uh, homozygous with an A in the first position. It has A in both places. But heterozygous in the second position, it, there's a G and a T, but we don't know which copy has the G and which copy has the T, and, and so on for the remaining positions. And um, typically, uh, at these polymorphic sites, there are only two common nucleotides, so we can encode the information in binary. Um, and so in a, in a binary notation, these haplotypes would be these two binary strings uh, just by encoding the two symbols in each position as one and zero in an arbitrary way. Um, and the genotype is given below where two indicates the uh, heterozygous case where you have both a zero and a one. So you have a bunch of these sequences of, of zeros, ones, and twos, and you're trying to figure out um, what the underlying haplotype pairs are for all of the individuals. And of course, there's no unique answer because you can pick them any way you like. Uh, however, there are a couple of ways in which you can be uh, led to prefer one choice over another. Um, so, okay, this, this simply uh, all repeats exactly what I've already said. There's this big haplotype mapping project. Uh, it's cheaper to measure the genotypes. And so we come to the haplotype phasing problem, uh, as I already mentioned given the genotypes of a set of individuals to determine their haplotypes. Now, one approach to this is, uh, uh, is the following. It was uh, pioneered by Dan Gusfield, a former Berkeley student who's now at UC Davis. Um, it's been observed that um, the genome is divided into blocks where uh, in each block, only a small number of haplotypes occur. And you see these polymorphic positions are fairly rare, maybe, maybe one in 10,000 or something like that. And so it's not too likely that in the course of evolution, uh, lightning has struck twice in the same position, that you've had two, two mutations in the course of evolution at that position, because most of the positions have never mutated. So um, it's fair to assume and, uh, uh, and uh, empirically uh, justified that you can find these blocks. There'll be certain hot spots for, for mutation where the assumption is not valid. But you can find these blocks which have evolved according to a perfect phylogeny, which means that at most one mutation event has occurred at any site. So one way to figure out uh, the haplotypes, even though it seems that there are many that it's a, not a well-posed problem, there are many possible solutions, is to assume at least locally that you have this perfect phylogeny uh, property. Um, and the, uh, there's a nice characterization of a perfect phylogeny. You see, if you look at any two uh, positions where the two nucleotides are encoded as 0 and 1, uh, then there are four possible combinations of nucleotides between a pair of uh, positions, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. But you can easily see that in a perfect phylogeny, which has evolved in a tree-like fashion with each site changing only once, you can't have all four of those joint states of the two positions. You can only have three of them. And that's the key to beginning to unravel this and figure out how the haplotypes could have, uh, what the haplotypes must be, assuming that the phylogeny is perfect. Um, so I'll skip this one because it, there's a picture. Uh, this, this picture came through. OK. So this is a, just a, a tree-like diagram to illustrate um, what a perfect phylogeny looks like. So this is supposed to represent the mutations that occurred from some uh, founding uh, sequence of nucleotides at these five positions uh, over evolutionary time or over, let's say, the history of the human race. And you see that uh, the assumption is, uh, and each edge shows uh, 
a single position where a mutation occurs, flipping you from a 0 to a 1. And perfect phylogeny means that no position occurs twice on the edges. Uh, and uh, so the problem is to recover this set of haplotypes when they're all jumbled up in pairs uh, uh, in the form of genotypes. And using this basic condition that you can only have three out of the four combinations, it's possible to give a very fast algorithm. In fact, later it was shown to be linear time uh, that would find a perfect phylogeny if one exists, if one exists, and would even characterize all of the perfect phylogenies. So, um, um, so we developed a, uh, a core algorithm, which is a fast test of whether a set of genotypes is compatible with a perfect phylogeny. Uh, and uh, also uh, other groups did this. And the, the fastest algorithm was actually due to, in the end, was due to Gusfield. Uh, but before that, uh, Halperin and uh, uh, Eskin, a colleague, uh, Eliezer Eskin, uh, developed a uh, program called Phase for, for this uh, problem of converting genotypes to haplotypes. And there's a lot more to Phase besides the core algorithm because you can only assume perfect phylogeny over these blocks and you have various violations of perfect phylogeny. But using um, a combination of the perfect phylogeny assumption plus the principle of parsimony, which means that you would like to have the smallest variability among the haplotypes uh, in a population consistent with the observed genotypes, kind of Occam's razor principle, uh, they were able to do very accurate phasing, very accurate haplotype assignments. And that program is, is very widely used by uh, researchers in the field. So uh, this completes. Uh, what I wanted to say about the uh, various projects that we've been doing at ICSI. And now I want to say a little bit about um, my personal views as to where we hope we might want to go in the future. And um, the basic uh, observation that a number of people have been making just, just, uh, just this month in CACM, for example, there's an article called Natural Computing, which is a, very much in the spirit of what I'm about to say, is that if there are many processes in nature which are typically studied in terms of physical uh, transformations and energy and, and the like, but which at their core can be abstracted as algorithms, information processing. So uh, out of the many examples, here are just a few. The regulation of cellular processes. Uh, you can think of cells as executing an algorithm to determine which proteins to make under various environmental conditions. And we have the sort of inverse problem of taking measurements on the cell and figuring out what, what is the algorithm that the cell is, con is conducting to, to uh, uh, decide uh, what, uh, how to perform its functions or the mechanisms of learning in the brain, or the way the immune system uh, marshals its, um, f its forces to fight off an invading uh, microbe, or the collective behavior of animal communities, the emergent behavior of ant colonies and beehives, or the way birds flock in formation. How do they do it? What, what is their algorithm? Um, or molecular self-assembly, the process by which molecules come together at a nanoscale to form structures by preferential binding to one another. It's a kind of algorithm. Or the strategic behavior of companies uh, or the evolution of web-based social networks. Can we give al stochastic algorithmic models of how beliefs propagate and information propagates through a, a social network? We have a tremendous laboratory for that with the World Wide Web where we Sociologists can take more measurements than they ever dreamed of making before. And now can they look at these social networks and figure out some of the general principles by which they operate. So these are just examples of the basic phenomenon that nature computes. So uh, to sum, I, we, we call this the computational lens. And frankly, we've been lobbying NSF to put more money into this with, with some success, actually. Um, a bunch of us have been pushing on this. Um, and uh, so just to restate the premise, the premise is that in many sciences, the natural processes being studied are 
computational in nature. And not only natural processes, but man-made man processes sometimes can be thought of as more like natural processes that just happened than like well-designed algorithms. And one example is the World Wide Web, because the web is not the work of a master designer, but it arises out of the independent activities of large numbers of, of, of agents. So uh, complex systems such as the web probably have to be analyzed empirically to, to sort of understand what's going on rather than uh, by figuring out the intent of some designer. So uh, our premise is that uh, viewing natural or engineered systems through the lens of their computational requirements provides new insights. And um, I think that this is a direction that we'll be pushing on at ICSI. It's compatible with the interests of the other groups. It's compatible with the interests of many colleagues on campus who are doing uh, quantum computing, uh, computational game theory, economic modeling. Uh, statistical physics from the point of view of information processing. Um, and it fights against um, a dictum which I think has had a very toxic effect on computer science, that some of the founders of computer science characterized computer science as a science of, art, of the artificial, a science that deals uh, not with naturally occurring entities, but with things that we specify. And this is true to some extent, compilers, operating systems, to some extent are specified by humans, but there's this whole other side of things. And I think it's uh, better for science and for the training of computer scientists to uh, not view our field as the science of the artificial, but also to give a lot of priority uh, to explaining information processing in um, systems that have emerged and in natural systems. So that's uh, the end of the talk. And uh, maybe at this point, I can ask for questions or comments. Yeah, so at this point, if someone has a question, hand them the mic. So earlier in the talk, um, you were talking about, uh, uh, for example, the paging algorithms, and you were comparing it against uh, an adversary, someone who was very specifically trying to make it as bad as possible. Yes. How does that compare to sort of in practice, you know, sort of a typical or maybe a random or something like that? So, so do the metrics you're using for the worst compare well with the typical? It's a good question, and the answer is not always. So in paging, for example, uh, there's the uh, widely used LRU paging algorithm. That happens to be a marking algorithm. So it's the best, it's as good as any, from the point of view of our, our metric, it's as good as any, as any algorithm, any deterministic algorithm. Um, but there are other uh, terrible algorithms. In, in fact, uh, there's an algorithm called flush when full, which is ridiculous. Namely, that as soon as the cache fills up, you evict everything from the cache. <laughs> That's not something you would want to do, but it has the same competitive ratio. Uh, so uh, you, the competitive ratio is a very strange measure. It's a kind of minimax regret measure. It's sort of saying, you know, uh, what's the worst that can be inflicted on you? And in practice, uh, I have to say that there are many situations where uh, it would give you the wrong answer. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank Dick again. Thank you.